Thanks for tuning into the Roaming Homesteaders today. We wanted to take a little bit of time and go through the top 14 questions that we've gotten from family and friends over the years. Without uh, any delay, let's jump right into it. question that we often get is what is homesteading anyway so for me I mean homesteading is a huge thing that you can answer many different ways but for me I mostly um, I take care of the house I take care of the children um, we homeschool I'm baking cooking cleaning doing laundry um, all the home things and then um, I also like help outside as well um, not as intense as my husband, but uh, I do a lot of the watering um, and just take care of the, like, just little things that um, I can. Well, I think Wendy had it right. Uh, you know, ho homesteading is many things and it can be many things for different people. And the activities that you choose to do uh, are, you know, it, it could be any number of things and it can all fall under the category of homesteading. But you know, homesteading, it is a state of mind, which is why you can have someone or folks like us who don't have a big farm to work on. And uh, they're still able to do activities that fit into that, that sort of mindset of homesteading. And, and again, homesteading, I think, is a mindset. And the mindset is this, that you are looking back in time to a period in our history and really history all over the world where people were more self-reliant. They just knew how to do a lot more everyday things for themselves. And they didn't shell out, just shell out cash to pay for the things that they needed. They would make the things that they needed. They would grow the things that they needed. They would grow the food that they had. They would trade with other people. And there was sort of this different economy, this different way of thinking. And if you look back mo most recently to the 1920s and 1930s where people were really suffering, they didn't have a lot, and they had to build these skills that they could use to survive and to thrive, uh, I think that that mentality is really what embodies homesteading. And I look back on that with my, my grandparents, especially my grandmother that I, I uh, spent some time with. She sort of adopted the homesteading ways late in life. Uh, but she was looking back on her upbringing during the Great Depression, uh, literally living in a tar paper shack on a beach in Los Angeles for a period after relocating from Missouri. And some of the stories that she told about her mother and the things that she did, and then the stories that my mother told me about her grandmother, the woman who was raising the family during the Great Depression, uh, after having fled you know, the, the Dust Bowl and everything that was going on in Missouri at the time, for a better life in California and then in Arizona. Uh, just that mentality of that generation. And that sort of self-reliance and that curiosity and ability to um, go learn those skills and then put it into practice, I think really embodies homesteading. And, and again, to me, you can do that anywhere, you know, which is, which is how we came up with this idea, homestead where you are. How can we help people see that homesteading is a way of thinking? It can be applied on a piece of land, on a farm, or out in the country, but really it's a way of thinking, and you can do it in your backyard, in the city, or you can do it on a big farm out in the country. You know, we all kind of want that farm experience, um, and that's not out of the realm of possibility, but you know, we're, we're changing how we think first, and then we're pursuing that to, to see where it can lead. But it really, really comes with a change of perspective before you can really start doing it. Because if you can't adopt that lifestyle, because it's tough. Uh, it's a tough thing to do, and most people don't want to do it unless it's necessary. And it's becoming more and more necessary. Uh, next question on the list is, uh, where are you from originally? Uh, th that's a complex question, but I'll, I'll let Wendy go first. <clears throat> I thought you were going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania. Uh, I grew up in the country north of Harrisburg and I um, was raised for the first like 11 years of my life on a farm 
and it was the most wonderful experience for me. Um, it was my family's farm. Um, they had a dairy there and uh, I got to experience just watching plants grow and just the freedom of the country and running around as a little kid. And then we moved um, to a very small town when I was 11, um, very small town, um, but uh, I loved it. And then that was where I was raised. I could give you the long drawn out story, but suffice it to say, before I turned 18 years old, I think I had moved a dozen times. Uh, my parents were not in the military. It was just a matter of uh, economics in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and, and we were just following jobs, uh, crisscrossing across the country. There, there was a period when I was about seven years old where we moved back to the Eastern Shore of Maryland in Kent County. And for a few years, we spent some time around my father's family. Um, for those few years that we spent in the Eastern Shore of Maryland, I too lived on a farm for a bit and I have some very fond memories. We lived in a, a 230 year old farmhouse that was actually condemned at the time. But I remember just going out in those fields uh, through the winter and the spring and the fall. And I just still have some very vivid memories of, of living on this, this active farm. We weren't farming it, but living on this farm and seeing all the activities and the cornfields and the mice and you know the old architecture and, and the pumpkin patches and it was just a world that was completely different because I was originally born and raised in Arizona, uh, Tucson, Arizona. So you can imagine Arizona is entirely different than the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, I also spent a lot of time in the San Francisco Bay Area and we had a lot of family in California because my grandmother, my great grandmother was one of 11 kids and this was the the, the group that left Missouri and all went out to California for a better life around the turn of the century, um, teens and 20s and 30s. And I just got a very broad view of the country, you know, Arizona, California, Maryland. I spent some time in Virginia. My grandmother had a farm there. So I'd go out there here and there in the summers and spend some time as I got older out there helping her to raise chickens and just having that experience in, in her farm near Lynchburg. I have a lot of memories of pruning grapevines there and growing chickens and picking okra and, and so many different things. And so we've gotten a pretty good view of the country and I think that'll come into one of our other questions. But uh, I'm from Arizona originally, Wendy's from Pennsylvania. The next question is, what is your favorite chicken? Well, mine is the Buff Orpington. Um, I just think they're cute and I think they're just some like a chicken that's just really family friendly especially for the kids and um, I don't know about any of you but I was a little afraid when we first got chickens and I was just afraid to like reach in there and get the egg and <laughs> I used to wear gloves um, to do it but that's those are my favorite chickens. We got chickens we first got chickens in 2011 um, but I had raised chickens on my grandmother's farm in about, I think, 94. I convinced her to buy 50 chicks and I had them shipped out from uh, Murray McMurray Hatchery and then I spent the summer growing the chickens and then I conveniently had to go home at the end of the summer before they were, had to be butchered. But those are Buff Warpingtons and, and I really enjoyed those chickens. Uh, Wendy's right, they are very calm chickens, big fat calm chickens and they lay lots of eggs. Uh, in 2011, we had, I want to say we had Barnevelders, black Barnevelders. We got from a local breeder down in the Bay Area. And they were a good chicken, but I think as, as Wendy alluded to, they were a little aggressive when you tried to take their eggs. And they were very loud, and they would, they, they kind of freaked you out, I think. <laughs> but uh, we, we did a lot of research, and we don't currently have chickens. I have a chicken coop that I'm almost finished building. It was my pandemic project. Um, and, and that's in the garage. We actually, I actually built it from scratch in our garage and I gave myself just enough clearance to jack it up and roll it out when it's time to move next. But uh, I think we had, we had talked about Buff Orpingtons mm -hmm. or Barred Rocks. Um, and you know, I think Morans are cool chickens too. Wyandots. Um, yeah, but I think we're probably gonna end up with, with some Buff Orpingtons next. This next question is, what is your favorite tomato variety? 
uh, I think if you've seen my seed haul video, uh, you, you'd realize that I'm a little overboard, but tomato varieties is one of the things that I collect because I'm a, I'm a fan of genetic diversity, you know, so if, if things really ever got out, got out of hand, I'd want to be able to grow as many different things as I could and have a good selection of breeding so that we had some stability in, in the varieties that we got. But you know, for me, I, I don't keep great track of the tomatoes that I grow. I put them in, I grow them, I get the tomatoes out of them, and it's awesome. And then I'm like, I remember I grew that, but I, you know, I don't keep notes on it. So I think this year I'm going to start keeping notes because we have so many good heirloom varieties. But mm -hmm. I'm excited for pineapple. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, me too. I. I I seem to remember that I've tried pineapple in the past, and I was thinking, mm, that's pretty tasty, I should grow that. But I don't remember when. It was a long time ago, if at all. And then I like the uh, ox heart types. I think the Golden King of Siberia is something we're growing this year, and I'm, I'm excited for it. But I like those big heritage heirloom sweet beefsteak types where you just bite into them and they're delicious and if they look ugly you just chop them up and turn them into salsa. So what, what do you think? What's your, what's your opinion on tomatoes? Well I'm excited for the pineapple variety this, this year. Um, I read about what the description was and they sounded delicious. Um, but I too like the, the bigger ones like the beefsteak, um, maybe Bonnie's Best. Uh, just ones that you can put into a sandwich and you chomp on it. Yeah, I, I think when, when we lived in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, you know, for the first year and a half of our marriage and then, then for a few years later, um, you know, wh where did we get those tomatoes? Maybe Central Market? Yeah, I think it was, a, it was a farmer's market, Central Market in Lancaster. But I remember we, we just made this series of BLT sandwiches with these tomatoes and it was like, these are, these are what tomatoes are supposed to be made into. It was just delicious and juicy and and uh, I think that sort of started the love affair with heirloom tomatoes. So. Yeah. What is the best homesteading state? Well, we've lived in several states ourselves, um, <laughs> three states mm -hmm. uh, as a couple, and uh, we've done a ton of research, watched lots of YouTube videos on best places to live, um, I don't know, we have a few that we have gone back and forth on and have tried to see if we could explore them a little bit more. Um, I mean, there are some great states out there. Uh, Idaho, Missouri, Tennessee, um, North Carolina, Virginia. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of them. You know, that's a great question. Uh, and I think that sort of comes down to, you know, where do you, where do you think you guys are gonna end up? Um, we're in Northern California right now and you know, I have a good job and you know, it pays well and you know, I'm not I'm not anxious to pick up and move again, but the, as you can imagine the situation here in California is really kind of frightening and here we are in the middle of June and we're paying I think I got some cheap gas the other day. It was six dollars a gallon and I filled up because I thought, oh, it's just gonna keep going up. And now it's, it's $7 a gallon now. I mean, it's, gas is $7 a gallon here right now. And that's, we're in the cheap part. Like if you go down to the Bay Area or Sacramento, or even out to the coast, there's a place that down by Monterey that everyone's been watching in the news. It's one of these small towns that doesn't get a lot of direct commerce and delivery. Their only gas station is charging $11 a gallon. Yeah, so I understand that that's unique to California. This is one of the states that, that is highly regulated like New York and, and whatnot. And we have, I think, a 51 cent per gallon gas tax here. So, you know, that's contributing significantly. But for us, you know, the, the best place, you know, we, we're, we're open to opportunities to go elsewhere not because we're particularly anxious to but but it really becomes a matter of dollars and cents when you have a family of seven and you have fuel expenses and utility expenses and and food expenses and rent and all the things that happen to be the highest in the nation you start looking at mm -hmm. you know the grass on the other side of the fence to see if it's any greener so we're really sort of monitoring that right now 
there might come a point where we just pick up and go. Uh, you know, for now we're just kind of watching to see because I think everybody's sort of anxious. You know, what's, what's going to happen? So to answer the question, uh, what's, what do we think the best homesteading state is? I mean, that, that's really subjective. Um, there's many, many factors that go into it. Once you look over the economics of a situation, your ability to find a job and you know what the cost of living is and the availability of housing and so many other things, uh, you know, that, that's really subjective to each family. You know, my parents live here in California and, and my brother. I have a sister who lives in Missouri, uh, in St. Louis, and then uh, Wendy's family is in Pennsylvania, and then Maryland, Southern Maryland. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of friends. You know, I, I went to school in Arizona and then Southwestern Virginia, and we know a lot of people in East Tennessee. Um, and we lived in Raleigh, North Carolina for a year. So, you know, we, we've had a good experience, but you know, if you're to break it down, again, there's lots of videos you can see on YouTube that explain all the differences and follow the factors. But, you know, for us, I think we really like Idaho. We spent some time up there last summer and the fall before, and we've traveled up there a couple of times. And um, we, we, love, we love North, Car North Carolina. We really didn't want to leave. Um, in 2018, my contract finished at my job there in Raleigh, and we just couldn't find anything else. It's, it's one of those saturated markets. So many people looking for work and just vying for all the limited number of jobs and the financial sector there. I mean, it, a lot of factors there. But we really didn't want to leave. We were, we were considering Statesville. Uh, we had looked up uh, near Franklin, and then up in um, up up in Asheville, near Lake Lure. I think over by Holler Homestead. I mean, I, I, first time I saw Holler Homestead, I looked at the dirt on their property, and I said, "That's near Lake Lure." I just I recognized it, didn't I? He did. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I remember places and I've, I've spotted places. So we're looking at, in those those areas of North Carolina, uh, the mountains of North Carolina, Buncombe, Yancey, Mitchell uh, counties over by Franklin. And then we, we really like East Tennessee. As a matter of fact, I'm heading out to East Tennessee for a, a trip, just sort of a scouting and collaboration trip uh, just to get away and check things out here in a week or so. Um, so I, I guess the long answer to the short question, I think topping our list of, of cool homesteading states would be Tennessee, North Carolina, Missouri, and Idaho, I think. Who's the better cook? So I, <laughs> Wendy says I'm the better cook. Um, I'm, I'm the, uh, I'm the headliner, you know, they bring me in to make some flashy dishes and throw it on the table and wow everybody. But the truth is Wendy's the, Wendy's the uh, daily warrior in the kitchen. She's, she's here feeding the family, cooking for everyone, you know, teaching the kids, using the stuff that I bring home. And, uh, you know, she's the one that gets to have all the fun with the, the cast iron pans and <laughs> she's going to be doing a, a video on that soon. But, uh, you know, so... Wendy's the, Wendy's the daily hero. I just come in for the flashy dishes to impress the uh, fancy guests. So, Do your kids like the homesteading lifestyle? <laughs> I don't think they know exactly what they're in for. We have tried to introduce them to you know, the things that we're doing, of course, and uh, we've shown them lots of videos of other folks out there. Um, and they all seem very excited, and they, they are excited for what we're doing as well. But, uh, you know, some of the things that, some of our dreams of what we would really like to do one day, I don't think they have a real clue as to what that would entail. <laughs> uh, the, last time we, the last time we really did, you know, a lot of outdoor homesteading things was when we had chickens and, and plants in, uh, in California 2011, 2012, 2013. And I think our oldest daughter is just a little too young. <laughs> yeah. you know, our second daughter was just born, that was 2013, and our oldest was only three at the time. So, I mean, you'll see some of the videos on the channel with the kids, you know, they're out at farm festivals and pumpkin patches and, 
you know, digging through and they're seeing animals in the petting zoo and they watch, they watch videos with us and they have their favorites. We like watching uh, White House on the Hill and, um, oh, there's so many. I can just go down my list. That, that could be a video. My favorite YouTube, my YouTube home sitters. But they love the ones with kids in them and they have this romanticized idea of what homesteading is going to be. And I don't think they understand that, you know, when you got to get up and slop the pigs at 5 a.m. when it's 20 degrees outside, you know, it's not a fun experience. But, you know, it's rewarding because it means you'll have bacon and ham hocks in, uh, you know, the middle of winter. But uh, I, don't think they, I don't think they know what they're in for. They, they have ideas, you know. You know, our second daughter, like, she wants barn cats and bunnies. They, they all have animals that they want and they, 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 we've never had pets. Unfortunately, we've been renting a series of rentals and you know, I wasn't gonna pay $300 for pet rent, you know. So they haven't had the experience of actually taking care of one yet like I did when I was growing up. But you know, they will. <laughs> did you really try to grow pineapples in Pennsylvania? <laughs> yes. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes. I tried to grow pineapples in Pennsylvania. I was, I was just rediscovering my garden prowess in uh, 2009 and 2010. We were in our first apartment and I went to this grocery store. It was just sort of this high-end fancy grocery store. And one of the things that they make for people every day is they dice up fresh pineapples. So they'll cut the tops off and you know, get all the spikes out and they'll dice up fresh pineapples. And I came in one day and I saw them just throwing away all these pineapple tops. And at the time I had just watched a video about growing pineapples from pineapple tops. So I went to the manager and I said, hey, can I have all those pineapple tops? And he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. So he gave me what, like 300 pineapple tops? I think so. It was insane. And so I started going back regularly and I just started experimenting with pineapples. And, you know, I'll, I'll show you the pictures here in a minute. Yes, I actually grew pineapples in Pennsylvania in pots outside on our patio. And then I think I planted a bunch in the garden. Mm -hmm. And they got big. You know, they got like three feet across in the garden. And then, you know, when winter rolled around, they all died because <laughs> it's way too cold. Uh, but they were pretty big and impressive at the time. And I told Wendy, I said, we should sell these as houseplants. <laughs> he totally said that. I, I said, we should sell these as houseplants. People are going to love these. It's like a subtropical, tropical plant you can have in your house. You can bring it in, in in the winter, put it outside in the summer, and we can make a killing on this. <clears throat> and she said, nobody would ever buy that. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. And then like 10 years later, we're in a Walmart, and they had a rack that was selling potted pineapple plants for house plants and I just looked at her and I said I wonder how many nobodies are buying these <laughs> I could have been rich <laughs> when did you first know you wanted to be a homesteader uh, well I, I think this goes back to one of one, one of my early answers is that homesteading is a state of mind uh, that, that has more to do with learning to do things yourself. Not making do, but actually learning how to do things and do them well in a different way so that you're not reliant on a system that's just being propped up artificially that you have no control over. Um, and that includes growing your own food, making your own clothes, you know, uh, obtaining raw materials, building your own houses getting your own firewood, you know, all the necessities of life that people used to do. There was a book that my grandmother gave me, I think back in the, I think it was the late 80s. She sent me a book. I was living in California in an apartment with my parents, and she sent me this book called Back to Basics. And it was one of those, it was either Mother Earth News or Reader's Digest books, and it was a hardbound, oddly shaped, it was longer than, it, it, was, it was wider than it was tall. And that book was basically, it, it spelled out the 1970s back to nature movement and all of these skills that people had, had rediscovered. You know, this was the first generation of, of, of back to gardening and, and back to basics. And that book was fascinating. I just memorized that book. 
you know, I, I can tell you everything you want to know about that book. And I've actually gotten my old, my daughter, my oldest daughter, to start reading that. But so that was probably when I was eight or nine, maybe a little bit older. Back to basics. That that book. That's what did it for me. I was a late bloomer. Um, despite the fact I grew up on a farm, I uh, didn't like. I saw my grandmas. Um, doing different homesteading kind of things, gardening. My own dad was doing a lot of gardening, um, but no one really took the time to show me how to do it myself. Like I saw them canning, um, you know, all kinds of things. But uh, it really wasn't until the pandemic that I really started to have my heart change for homesteading. Like even after we got married and he was doing all these different things, we had, you know, had chickens, strawberries, uh, all kinds of potted trees and he was grafting trees and these huge gardens. I just kind of looked at him uh, as like, he was, it was, those were his hobbies. He was just doing these things and that was great for him, but I was, you know, I was in here with the kids taking care of them. Um, but once the pandemic happened and, you know, life just really radically changed for everybody, um, I just started to really see the value in that and my memories of the way I was raised and seeing my grandmothers do those things um, just really came back to me. And I just really wish that someone would have taken the time to like, you know, teach me how to do those things. Uh, but they didn't, like my, they didn't teach my mom, they didn't teach my dad really how to do those things. And you know, we grew up in the 80s and 90s and- uh, Then they closed the dairy. Yeah, and they closed the dairy. Uh, we could have taken over. We could have. <laughs> uh, well, it, it, Wendy was right. It was a rough road. Uh, and I wasn't doing any of these things because I was still in school uh, until right, you know, I graduated a week before we got married. And, you know, it was like, okay, we're married. Surprise! I have all these weird side things. And as I started to grow gardens and do, do all these things, it was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and and it, was, it, <laughs> it was a source of conflict in our early marriage, we'll just say. <laughs> I, I remember this one garden I had in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in about, was it 2010? I, I grew these beautiful zucchini. Oh <laughs> my God. Oh. oh yeah. Oh yeah. I grew about, 300 pounds of zucchini. I had so much zucchini, I was giving it away. We were eating it till it came out of our ears. And I decided, oh, we're going to, we're gonna make bread, we're gonna do it, we're gonna have it coming out of our ears. So, I don't know, like six months later, I go in the fridge looking for zucchini, and it was gone. And I was, <laughs> I was like, where's, where's my zucchini? And mm -hmm. Wendy got this sheepish look on her face, and. She ultimately admitted to me that she had thrown it all away. Please don't hate me. Please don't hate me. <laughs> and I don't bring that up to tease her anymore. Well, I'm not angry about it, but it was it was just baffling to me because she had she had secretly thrown it out bit by bit, thinking like, what are we ever gonna do with this? I don't want this in my freezer. And uh, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> it's something to laugh about now, but. Um, you know, I, I, I think I realized at that time, you know, I was sort of pulling in this one direction, sort of stubbornly pulling in this one direction, and my wife didn't share my vision. And I realized, you know, I, I haven't really, I haven't really taken the time to explain why all this is valuable and why, I, where I learned it from and why I think it's valuable. I think it was an awakening for me because I had to, I had to take the time to go through it a little bit more and, and sort of explain it and sort of pull back. There were still times where I did these crazy projects like grafting 300 fruit trees twice, um, you know, growing pineapples, getting chickens. But I ended up being able to build a really awesome Amish style chicken coop for us as sort of the last culmination of all that project. And it was, it was about that time where we had a lot of time together and we were looking through all this stuff because we were all at home together. And it was like, you know, being able to watch some of the videos together, read some of the books, and to see like, hey, there's a shortage of pork, or there's a shortage of chicken, or toilet paper, what's that, you know? 
when you, when you can't buy these things and you, you know, I think it was a combination of things. I, I, I think you saw some more value in it because of our circumstances, but also you had seen me doing things and taking more time to explain it to you. Mm -hmm. right, what, do you what do you think of that? So, yeah, I would say that was true. Yeah. So, why did you stop making beer, wine, and mead? <laughs> <laughs> and he made all three. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of those early projects that I mentioned was uh, alcohol making. We'll, we'll just call it what it is. I, I made hooch. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't moonshine, although I watched all the shows about that and really <laughs> enjoyed reading a, a lot about it. But one of the things that I started reading up on was uh, mead making, because when we got married, yeah. I had I'd been making mead. I was in school still in, in Virginia. And I was making mead in, in my room? dining room. I was making it in my dining room. And I was making mead. And here I was making it year after year after year. And I was getting better and better and better at it. And for those of you who don't know, mead is just honey wine. It's a wine that's based off of fermented honey instead of sugars or, or fruit juice. And, you know, it's the thing of Vikings. You know, the Vikings with the, the Viking horn. And they drink, drink till they got plots and then go off and raid the villages on the river. Uh, but that that was the drink and I just researched as much as I could about it and started making it and I got better and better and better and about the time we got married mm -hmm. I think when we were dating I gave you some of my cherry mead mm -hmm. oh man <laughs> that stuff's dangerous so when we got married I mean right away we moved into our first apartment and I started making fruit wine because <laughs> I had wanted to make fruit wine so we'd gone and we'd, we'd gotten a bunch of strawberries from a oh. strawberry patch. This is, like, oh. this is like a week after we got back from our honeymoon. And I started a batch of strawberry wine. And I threw it in the closet. And this was the first experiment with whole food or whole fruit. And it, on my birthday, on my 30th birthday, <laughs> yes. the whole thing exploded oh. inside the closet. <coughs> and this is the closet that had our water heater in it. <laughs> And our ironing board and a bunch of stuff we were storing just exploded all over the closet. And I don't know, what did you think when that happened? Lucky for him, it was his birthday because otherwise he would have been cleaning up himself. That really started, I knew what I was doing at that point. You know, apart from that disaster, I knew what I was doing at that point. And the, the, wines, and, the wines and meads that I made at that point were uh, competition quality. And we had this idea that I would um, start putting this in all the competitions that I could, you know, state fairs, local fairs, wine, wine organizations, <clears throat> and I did, and I started winning awards, left and right. I mean, I think the first award I award I won was a silver. Was it for that? Uh, was it the peach wine, or I forget what it was. I have a list somewhere, but I started winning awards, a lot of awards, and. I was using winemaking manuals, like commercial winemaking manuals, and temperatures and yeast selections and, and the whole shebang. Stainless steel containers, I mean, it, it, was, it was a proper wine. And we started getting this idea that we would open a winery, and we start touring wineries all over, sampling stuff left and right. And we had so much booze. It looked like one of those photos of the, the Prohibition uh, uh, G-men, you know, going around to the stills with axes and pouring out huge jugs of Italian wine from the speakeasies and I mean that's what our house looked like. And cordials, don't forget the cordials. Oh, cordials. <clears throat> the vodka cordials. Legendary. Anyway, I was really good at it. And then it was 2013, I think it was 2013 or 2014 that I submitted one of my meads. It was a champagne uh, Melamel, which is a fruit, fruit mixed honey wine. And it was on a whim that I submitted that because I was just experimenting. Anyway, I won gold. Yeah, the, the Mazer's Meat Cup, I won gold 2013. About then, uh, we had moved back to Pennsylvania at the time. And about then I realized uh, I've been drinking a lot of my product. I was drinking like a fish. Uh, it, it, it caused some strife in our marriage. I think we were both drinking, mm -hmm. but it, it was it became an issue. And although we're Christians, you know, I was ignoring I was ignoring Proverbs twenty verse one: "Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and those who are led astray by it are not wise." 
but for us it came to a point where I realized this thing had taken over my identity and you know my value was in getting the next award and and making a commercial go of it I mean I was consulting with wineries and, and meteries and very close to opening something up and I and I looked at my my two youngest daughters and I said or my my oldest daughters and I said you know what example is this setting for them and what are they gonna remember so um, yeah it, it was just a decision that we came down to we, we sat down and talked and I said uh, you know not to be too serious here uh, you know I, I said this has the potential to destroy our family and, and for us, it had gotten out of control. I think I told you the decision that I had come to was just to stop all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I sold a couple thousand dollars worth of mm -hmm. brewing equipment. Yeah. I, I told her, we can't even have it around. We just got to get rid of it. Just gone. And it was very painful for me because I was seriously thinking that this was going to be our life and our business. And we're going to make a lot of money from it. I said, we're, we're gonna have to go cold turkey on all of it. It's all gotta go. So we sold a couple thousand dollars worth of uh, our own equipment. And I, uh, how many gallons did we dump? It was, like, it was like prohibition, you know, the day after prohibition. We were dumping, I don't know, 15 or 25 gallon carboys down the drain in the basement uh, utility sink. It, it all went. So fall of 2015, that was the last time I had a drink. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say it was October, November 2015, cold turkey. And I'll tell you, it was painful. It was very painful for about two years for me. That, that was a choice I made. So seven, seven years ago? Was that seven years ago now? This fall, seven years. So that's why. So I was really good once. I've got the awards and the ribbons and things on and a good story to tell, but it's, it's a cautionary tale at best, so uh, that's why I stopped making all that. What does your family think of your dreams? <laughs> what does your family think of our dreams? <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, they kind of look at us strangely and just kind of wonder what we're doing, why we're doing it. You know, why can't you just go to the grocery store? Why can't you just you know, stock up on things from, you know, Costco or, you know, somewhere else. Get it from Amazon. Like, why, why do you have to try to make your own soap? Or why do you have to try to make your own, uh, you know, anything. Like, like anything from scratch? Like, just get it from the store. Uh, like normal people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not normal, in case you haven't figured that out. I mean, I think they think it's it's fine for us and that sort of thing, but... It, it, I think they think it's quaint, but they worry about our children. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my family... I, I've, I've been trying to convince my family, I think more than Wendy's, that they need to uh, catch the vision just because of what's going on in the world right now. I, I sort of worry for my folks. They're close to retirement age and, you know, I... I'm worried about them here in Northern California and them staying here, but you know they're they're well invested here. I mean they've been here for 27 years now, I guess, and you know I just I just worry about them. This is becoming a hostile environment for individually minded people. I think to an extent they they understand the value, the idea of of growing everything you eat or doing without electricity or having a different watering system or anything like that is a, is a little, I don't want to say frightening. Well, why would you, why would you go backward when you have all the modern conveniences? And you know, I'm trying to convince them to, if we do ever go anywhere, I'm trying to convince them to go with us. Um, but I, I think they still look at our dreams as sort of backward. You know, there, there's a magazine called Backwoods Home that I've been subscribing to for years, and my father jokes and call it calls it backwards home. And I think th I think that sort of sums up how a lot of people look at it. It's like that's really backward. Why why would you do that when you don't have to? 
um, and, and, and I explain the same thing to them. I do that so that if I have to, I'll know how. Um, yeah, so I think that's how they look at it. You know, your family kind of scratches their heads. My family is, understands the value, but it's kind of like, you know, we don't have to, so why do it? <laughs> but we love them all. I think they just think we're weird. The next question is, how did you start making chocolate? Well, I remember the, we <coughs> were driving home from a vacation at the beach in North Carolina, and we just started talking, and we had just visited, while we were there at the beach, like a little chocolate shop, and we just started talking about, like, we could maybe do something like that. And we just, you know, it was a few hour drive home, and we were just talking, and I think by the time we got home, we kind of came up with a name for our chocolate company and, and uh, uh, plans to like buy, we were going to make bean to bar chocolate and we were going to buy the beans and the equipment and start making it. The time, it was 2017, so I think it was the fall of 2017, we just moved down to North Carolina in July and uh, we, we decided to get away from the weekend, we went down to Wilmington, so we went down to the beach. And as I said, for a couple of years, it was very difficult for me to have walked away from, um, you know, alcohol production. You know, I was convinced that we were going to make our, our fortune from that and just really be well off. And I was just convinced that that was it. That was my shot and it was over. And, and we had gone down to Wilmington for the weekend and we went into this little chocolate shop. And I, and I remember talking to the guy and I said, so, you know, do you make all of this or or what? And he said, yeah, we make some of it, but most of it we get from, you know, some company that makes makes the chocolate and they send it to us and we melt it down and we turn it into candy. And, you know, so they get the bulk chocolate from somewhere else and then they melt it down and then they pour it over pretzels or whatever they're going to sell it on. And they make little candies and then they sell it to tourists. And I asked him, I said, do you, do you make a good living off of that? And he sort of, it was like, <clears throat> yeah, you know, put chocolate on anything and people will buy it. And it kind of clicked in my mind there for just a split second and I thought if this guy can get chocolate and sell it to people you know I wonder if this is something we can do and we had actually gone to was it Hawaiian chocolate factory in Kona Hawaiian chocolate factory in Kona we went into this place and they showed us how they make how they grow the chocolate beans and then how they ferment it and then cure it and then that's the raw ingredient that they send out and you actually make chocolate from it. So that was in the back of my mind and we heard this guy talking in North Carolina about how he made a, made a mint on chocolate for tourists. And, we, and that kind of put a little seed in my mind and I said, huh, maybe, maybe, just maybe, chocolate could replace sort of alcohol as, as a business. And I wouldn't feel guilty about, you know, getting people addicted to chocolate because one, they're already addicted to chocolate. <laughs> and two, you know, it's not going to get you drunk. It's not going to kill you. You're not going to crash your car after going to a chocolate bar and, you know, dosing up on hot chocolate <laughs> unless there's booze in it. So we're driving back, driving back up to Raleigh from, from uh, Wilmington. And I said, maybe we could make chocolate. And then you said... Ding, ding, ding. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I asked a woman if she'd like to make <laughs> chocolate for a living and make money from it. And uh, yeah, you can imagine. So for the rest of the drive home, it was a couple hours drive, we kind of dreamed and we talked about it. But anybody who knows me knows that I am, am I don't want to call it OCD, and I'm not manic, but I... Obsess? I obsess. And when I grab onto something, I embrace it wholeheartedly. So I was actually teaching at the time and uh, I spent my spare time researching as much as I could about chocolate and chocolate making. I just obsessed over it and I learned everything I could and my mother about that time came out for a visit and she asked you know what can we do for you guys is there anything you want as a gift right now the holidays are coming up and I told her you can buy us some chocolate making equipment. She gifted us with the money to purchase the, you know, a few items of chocolate making equipment. So we got a, a grinder and a roaster mm -hmm. and a bunch of molds and, you know, a bunch of different things to, to make this. And then I built a winnower. winnower. 
uh, chocolate bean winnower out of a, a brand new vacuum shop vac from Home Depot or something. I mean, I went all out. And within a month of, of that vacation, we were making chocolate in our kitchen in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I started researching the business side of it and going to, we started touring bean to bar chocolate mm -hmm. places all over the country, uh, wherever we went. And we went up to Asheville. There was one or, one or two in Raleigh. I think there was two in Raleigh. Escazu and what was that other one? The bigger one. Can't think of it right I'm now. I'm ashamed that I've forgotten the names <laughs> because you know that was a, that was a real big part of things. Yeah, we frequented it. Yeah, so we we started going to chocolate companies, bean to bar chocolate companies, like we had been going to bars and, and microbreweries, and I just dove right in. And I still know all of this, but uh, that's how we started. It was an idea after a vacation. And when we moved to California in 2018, we learned that California had just banned uh, most small-scale chocolate making because they had decided that uh, chocolate has high levels of lead and heavy metals and that it qualified under Prop 65 for a carcinogenic substance. That go figure, chocolate. California ruins everything. Um, and they basically came up with this pay-to-play scheme that if you weren't a big company that could pay to be exempted from the regulations like you know the, the big companies, you effectively were regulated out of the market. So we couldn't just come into California like we had intended to do in North Carolina and start you know, a, a home kitchen chocolate making company because there were all these uh, heavy regulations. So we continued to make chocolate in our kitchen just for ourselves and our friends. We couldn't sell it. We couldn't start a business uh, here. And we eventually just shelved everything. We did enter some of it into some of the local fairs and state fairs too. Yeah, we got some awards at the state fair and the local fair, district fair. And so we shelved everything. We kept everything. I mean, we have labels, we have you know, business stuff, we have things ready to go if we end up in a, in a, in a more conducive environment, business friendly environment. For now, it's sort of all shelved in the garage. That's how we started making chocolate. Th those will be many videos in the future. I don't know how they fit into homesteading per se, but it'll be an interesting uh, watch. The question we get a lot, you know, people, people hear that we have five kids and it's like, oh, you're homesteaders and you have five kids, are you Mormons? No. No. <laughs> I grew up in Arizona, uh, a very heavily Mormonized state. Uh, I mean, it's right next to Utah, as you can imagine. A lot of folks up in, in Phoenix are Mormons. We're not Mormons. We are actually Christians. We attend a just a, a Bible-preaching evangelical church, and we're really good friends with the pastor and his family, and we're just really blessed by that. But, you know, our, our faith is informed by uh, a traditional biblical understanding, and we take the, the Word of God as literal. We take the Bible as the Word of God, and the Word of God as literal, and we, you know, we seek to follow it in, in a faithful understanding and living out of the gospel of Jesus Christ with no companion books, nothing extra. Um, and, and as you may have noticed at the end of our videos, we put a Bible verse up. You know, the Word of God it endures forever, and we think that it is the absolute model for our lives in every way. Uh, and we we follow that and that alone. Okay, our last question is, where are you going from here? <laughs> uh, that that's a good question. We're we're open to other opportunities, but you know, with with the economy and circumstances being what they are right now, we're not act actively pursuing things. I, I guess we have our eyes open, but. I think that's just how everyone is right now, seeing what the opportunities are out there. Where's, where's all this going? You know, where, where's the political situation going? Where's the supply chains going? Where are jobs going, interest rates, inflation, cost of fuel, electricity? To make these sort of shifts right now, um, big life changes, they were kind of appealing you know, maybe a year ago or, or 18 months ago when everybody was flush with cash and it seemed like things were picking up again. 
but then you kick in with the war in Ukraine, uh, political uncertainty, uh, turmoil, uh, economic turmoil, interest rate hikes. But you know, I guess guess the good answer is to say we're we're open to opportunities. We're always looking at the needs of our family and what would be a best fit. We would like to buy a home and uh, land. We've been saving up for that for some time. I think for us, the idea is to get at least 10 acres with a house and something that we can do do something with. But that that's the big thing with us is to keep an open mind, to dream. Uh, you know, our main focus, as I think it should be, is uh, serving God. You know, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and these other things will be added to you. Not to say that you'll get everything that you want in life because you serve God first, but you know, your needs will be met uh, and God will give you direction. And you know, your focus should be serving him and not just yourselves. You know, serving him, serving others, and not just yourselves. And it, it, if something opens up and we're led in that direction, I think we'll pursue it. But in the meantime, you know, we're trying to expand gardens, uh, activities at the home, we're planning for chickens. Wherever we end up, we're gonna have a chicken coop to roll right out, throw some chickens in it and you know, start, start our chicken operation. What we really wanna do is do what we've been saying on some of our videos and teaching people that, you know, homestead where you are. Uh, wherever you are, in whatever circumstance you find yourself, you can have the mentality of self-sufficiency and service and um, doing things for yourselves that we want to teach people. Um, that's really what we like to focus on is helping people see the value, changing how they think, that they don't have to be limited by their circumstances to start doing these things even in a small way, and that they're ability to thrive under difficult circumstances will be greatly improved if they change their mentality and they start pursuing you know, knowledge that will help them uh, do some of these things for themselves and to lessen the impact of supply chain issues and shortages and inflation and everything else. I think I just really want to start putting into practice teaching some of the things that I wasn't taught um, growing up and just being very intentional about teaching our children about that and hopefully sharing that on these videos as well. Uh, just different skills that are really needed in this day and age, but are still overlooked by so many people. I, I think it's important that couples be on the same page on these things. And now that we are, I think it's been very refreshing and, and We've gotten some traction on some things. You have to get that vision to be a homesteader uh, because it's going to be a lot of work. I think as, as uh, one of our favorite um, couples on YouTube is Homesteady, and oh, yeah. uh, you know, and at times they come across as really goofy, and I love the I love the mustache, but uh, you know they they share a vision, you know, and and when a couple shares a vision like that, they can go off and and uh, work hard together in a direction, whatever that is. I, I would absolutely agree. Uh, we had, for so many years, he was kind of pulling one direction and I was just <clears throat> kind of like, I guess maybe the anchor, just holding us back maybe. Like I was, you know, moving a little perhaps in trying to help out, but not really, like not in my heart anyway. I was still holding back so much and grumbly and just, wondering why he was doing what he was doing and you know that was okay for him but not for me um, or at least not involved me too much but just these last you know few years of talking and dreaming I feel like we're we're heading the right direction same direction and uh, just being very intentional about uh, it, yeah just talking through these things and you know seeing a vision for our children yeah, for our family as a whole, mm -hmm. you know, you know, things we want to instill in our children, things we would like for ourselves, but skills that we want to build so that we can help others. Uh, that's really what it boils down to. Yeah, so those are sort of the top questions that we've gotten over the years uh, about homesteading and sort of the things that we do and, and our motivations in you know, pursuing this uh, YouTube channel and just this sort of lifestyle. 
uh, as, as a teaching tool and also a way of interacting with folks and just encouraging them and, and helping to build that community. You will you'll certainly hear more from us uh, in the months ahead and, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy coming along on the adventure. This is sort of just an opportunity to chit chat and get to know us a little bit more uh, and, and how we're thinking and approaching all of this. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below. And as always, you can subscribe right over here and click the bell so you get notifications when we post new videos. So thanks for watching today. Remember, you too can homestead where you are. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.